Hi, readers. Welcome to Books Connect Us from Penguin Random House. This is a podcast about staying connected with each other and the stories and authors who inspire us. Today's episode is a conversation between authors Abby Waxman and Kristen Higgins. Abby Waxman is the USA Today bestselling author of Other People's Houses, The Garden of Small Beginnings, and her latest, I Was Told It Would Get Easier, which follows the mother-daughter duo, Jessica and Emily Bernstein, as their carefully mapped out college tour devolves into a series of off-roading misadventures. Kristen Higgins is the New York Times bestselling author of nearly 20 novels, including Life and Other Inconveniences, and her latest, Always the Last to Know, which examines a family at the breaking point in all its messy, difficult, wonderful complexity. Let's join Abby Waxman and Kristen Higgins. Hi, Abby. Hi, Kristen. How are you? (laughs) I'm good. How are you? I am well. I am very well. Where are you? I am, where am I geographically or where am I? I'm in Los Angeles. Ah, okay. And you're in and, Connecticut? Uh, I'm in Massachusetts. Massachusetts? Yeah. Nice. Yeah, very nice. Yeah. And um, how are you doing in pandemic times? Um, it's, you know, it, I, I'd like to say that it's made a huge and major difference in my life, and it has, but I can't say that it's, like, I still dress in pajamas I did before the <laughs> pandemic. I still struggle to work. I did before the pandemic like it all it's doing is really having my children be in the house all the time which makes it yeah harder to work but nicer to be here you know yeah and you have three teenage daughters I have three teenage daughters yes oh god yes. bless you thank you but yours are older right you have <laughs> long lashed are... children I read it yes they're uh, my daughter's 24 and my son is 21 I'm and... looking forward to that the other side of the hill it's great yeah it's great and I um, I loved your book. Um, I loved yours. Thank you. And yours is called I Was Told It Would Get Easier. Yes. And, and yours is called Life and Other Inconveniences. Uh, that was last year's book. Oh, I thought that's what we were, oh, my God. Stop recording. I thought we were talking about that book. Oh, my God. That's the book I've read. Oh, no. Oh, my new book is called Always the Last to Know. Oh, for fuck's sake. <laughs> That's okay. I, I'm glad you liked Life and Other Interviews. I did. <laughs> I loved it. I did. I, it, was, it was beautiful, yes. Um, oh, my God. But um, that's okay. I will, I'm more than able to talk about both. So tell me. Tell me about your new book, Kristen. <laughs> my new book, which I'm looking forward to you reading. <laughs> I can hardly wait. Is, uh, it's called Always the Last to Know, and it's about uh, the three women of the Frost family. They're ba- the mother, Barb, and the daughters, Juliet and Sadie. And they all have to come back to home when the dad has a, a massive stroke. Okay. And so each woman is dealing with the same problem in a very different way. Their relationships with their dad and husband are very different and... Um, so it's sort of about these three women in a time of crisis. Uh, Barb was thinking about divorcing her husband the day before he had his stroke. Um, yeah. So, um, you know, they have a long marriage and it's just gotten stale and she's tired of being taken for granted. And then boom, she ends up as caretaker. Um, Juliet is in her forties and she's trying very hard to like be the perfect wife, perfect career woman, mother, uh, person community member mentor and and it's really catching up with her the stress of of trying to maintain that and then there's Sadie the younger sister who is sort of a free spirit she's been living the life of an artist and uh, elementary school teacher in New York and she comes home um, for the first time in a long time and she uh, is dealing with the love of her life Noah who um, you know who was her childhood sweetheart and even though they love each other very much, they've never been able to want the same things. So it's like a romantic comedy storyline in there. Um, and uh, it was really fun to write a book about families and the mother-daughter relationship. And we have right. that in common. Yes. With I, I was told it would get easier. Yeah, I mean, I think that the mother-daughter relationships um, 
are just endless, endless fodder. Like it yeah. just, you know, and because it changes all the time. I mean, that's the thing um, that I've discovered is that, you know, and I, I talk about this a little bit in the book, that you think you have it just about when you think you've nailed it, just about when you're like, oh, okay, yeah, I can handle these kids. They mm-hmm. become teenagers, and then all of a sudden, every skill, every tool you've used up to then is completely useless. Yes. <laughs> and in fact, you know, any time, if I ask my children, are you hungry? One more time, they're going to kill me. Like I'm just <laughs> So constantly trying to make sure that they've had enough to eat and that they've been to the bathroom recently is not useful when they're 16. <laughs> I they just, know. I... They just find it very, very annoying. There, there was a line in your book where you refer to like the golden years of motherhood. Right. Um, when you really feel competent and, you know, you can make their healthy meals and right, know that exactly. they ate them and, and invite the nice friends over and, and, um, and then they become teenagers. And, um, you know, I have a, a son and a daughter and it was a very different experience. Um, but I, and I have a very easy relationship with my daughter and my son too, but they're such different people. Um, and as you say, like the little boy who would jump into my arms and snuggle is no more. Yeah, I know. <laughs> it's I, so you sad. know, you yeah. miss them. You mourn yeah. them. Your book yeah, had so sad. much that I loved. I loved the different point of views. Thank um, you. You know, you went from the bookish life of Nina Hill, which was a runaway hit. And uh, <laughs> don't make a snorting noise. It was. Sorry, yes. Own it. <laughs> okay, I own it. I own it. It's, yes. Uh, and that was, you know, I loved that book because it's about an in- independent bookstore and a and a nerdy girl who loves to read and play trivia. So, like, everyone I know right. could be Nina Hill and myself, too. Yeah. And that was, I think, like, I, I loved it. I thought it was so sharp and funny. But it's definitely, to me, a romantic comedy. Yeah. And... Um, and this new book is also very funny and dry, um, but it's it's really about the mother daughter relationship. Was that a conscious decision for you? Did you did you plan to write more of a women's fiction book? Yeah, I mean, I wanted to write about the mother daughter. I'm just I'm sort of inherently lazy, and I want to write about what I'm going through right now because yeah. that's the best material and the things I can remember. Right, so. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> I was very much going through having these teenage daughters and and also just watching other women go through it in different ways. You know, other women struggle with, in, with different things. Mm-hmm. It's not like we don't all struggle. We just, there are different aspects of that experience that, that challenge us differently. And so I wanted to write about a woman who just was really struggling with the sort of whiplash of feeling competent in one area of her life and utterly incompetent in another area of her life and sort of what that was about but then Mm -hmm. I also wanted to write from the daughter's point of view because I feel like being a teenage girl in actually just possibly being a teenage girl period is just a very challenging period of time and you you want to you want to be close to your mother but you also want her to leave you alone forever you know it's a constant push pull and so that's what I wanted to write about yeah yeah, it reminded me in some respects of that wonderful movie, uh, Lady Bird. Yes. Um, you know, where, where they Who have... Who hasn't wanted to jump out of a car? <sighs> I, I, I love that, that movie, and I loved the very realistic tension and love between the mother and daughter, you know, where they're fighting bitterly and yelling at each other, and then the mom says, oh, this dress would look pretty on yeah, you. Yeah, that like, scene oh, is... I love it, mommy! <laughs> yeah, that scene is completely the best, to me, the, the most brilliant scene in the movie is exactly that exchange because Mm -hmm. it does it does do that it does switch on on a dime the relationship you know and you'll be talking and arguing with your kid and then suddenly something will come up that allows you to have a momentary you know um truce about something and then you'll go right back into it exactly as if if the fight you know never stopped so yeah it's it's hard yeah it's I in, always last to know the sisters are 12 years apart in age and they had completely different childhoods. You know, right. one had uh, a mother who was older. She thought she was in menopause rather than having another baby. Um, and she was kind of worn out by the time Sadie came along. But Juliet had this magical, wonderful childhood where she and her mom were super close. And um, as a result, each 
each sister has a favorite parent. And for Sadie, it's her dad who is now so dis disabled and different. And she's so invested in his recovery. Right. Um, and Juliet has a very different perspective on her father. Um, and I really liked writing that, that, that each kid gets a different parent. Right. You know? um, now, Emily is an only child. So I yeah. think that's, that's an interesting dynamic, too, because there's only you and all the hopes right. and dreams right on you. Right. And I loved in the book that, um, that, you know, college is like that culmination for parents. You're going to college, you'll get into a good school and then, you know, all my work will here will be done. Right. And Emily has some different views on that. Right. She's she wondering does. like, is this the right move? Is this the right time? Do I really want this? Especially in our culture, it seems like it's sort of, it, it's just, assumed that you're going to go that if you're of a certain if you're a certain kind of person you go to college and that's just the way it goes um but increasingly as you know college is so expensive mm -hmm. and so challenging to get into that you often come out of college with a huge amount of debt and you still know closer to knowing what the hell you want to do with your life than you were I before know. and so I find that deeply disturbing you know yeah. but that's because I grew up in a time and a country where college was mostly expected but at the same time really affordable you know the, the local authority would pay for the I think my college tuition was 600 pounds and the local <laughs> the local authorities you know education authority paid it so yeah. yes my parents had to pay for my you know room and board mm -hmm. but I came out without debt and that's a huge and so did everybody yeah and that's a huge difference it means that as a young adult the same age as your children you can make a decision about what you want to do that doesn't mm -hmm. isn't predicated on and I have to service this debt it right. was just such a bummer right my son calls college the new high school nice. you know where you're really determining what you want to be when you grow up in the four right. years of college rather than you hit the ground running as a 22 year old in an established field right. it's just not really how it works and I think the pressure is great you know to decide at 17 what you want to be when you grow up Right. Um, for me, I wanted to be a pediatric surgeon, and that is just not working out well at all. <laughs> is it? It's still t there's still time. Like, I don't you know. Can... <laughs> I'd like start my residency in my sixties, so I I'm probably gonna have to say. I believe that. in you. I think you can do it. Well, I think I'll just dedicate my body to science, and that way I'll go to medical school you see, after that's, I'm dead. Yeah, that's genius. See, because <laughs> then you have an, another career. After you're actually dead, which is yeah. just really kind of a, a sort of overachiever kind of thing to do. <laughs> Kristen changed her career at the end of her life, becoming a cadaver. <laughs> That's right. Um, um, I, do your children uh, now that they're older? Do they? Do they? Is the relationship with you now that your children are young, really young adults? Are you still their mother? Like, is it still maternal, or is it more collegiate? Like, how? Please tell me because it's it seems yeah. very far away. I would say my daughter uh, is we're very much still she still calls me mommy. You know we're very close, good friends. We're very similar in personality, so we don't go more than a day without talking. And right. she's also very I think she's very generous um, in that like she just moved in to a, an apartment on her own. And I, you know, I realized like, oh, she'll never live at home again. You know, she's right. going to, to make a life on her own. She, she has a career. And, but she said, why don't you come over and help me settle in? Because you're so good at that, mommy, Aww. you know? And so I, I think like, that's a gift she gives me. Um, awesome. My son is, is more, we're more collegiate. He needs less reassurance and, and hands on, but we have the best conversations and, um, and he's got a great sense of humor, and and we're we're pals. We're like movie buddies. We love to talk about right. books and 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 uh, television shows and stuff. And but he's much more independent, you know. Yeah. Um. So it's you know I I love being a mom. It's um, definitely like the greatest joy in my life, and I love to write about mothers. Right. And. Um, you know, in the character in Always the Last to Know, we have Barb who adores her firstborn daughter, who is everything you could want in a child. And there's a lot of me and my daughter in that right. relationship. 
And then there's this other kid that you, who's so different and harder to raise and harder to relate to and, and who doesn't seem as interested in, in her mom and her relationship with her mom. It was really, it was really fun to write, you know, um, as you said, mothers and their children are just endless fodder. Um, and I, I really enjoyed uh, reading Emily's point of view. I mean, it's, it's clear, you know, teenagers. <laughs> yes. My teenagers are not reticent about expressing their opinions. Uh-huh. So they tell me a lot about what they're thinking and going through. Uh, so, yeah, anytime they wrote, said anything funny, I would just steal it. Yeah. Have they read the book yet? No, they don't read any of my books. Oh, they're, no, they're, they're, they're horrified. Children. They're horrible. They are, it's sharper than a serpent's tooth. Um, <laughs> they, uh, I think that, I don't know, I think they're not particularly interested in the genre in, in particular. Like, they're not really interested in reading novels about people who are much older than them. Like, mm-hmm. it's not. And then also, I write very much as I talk, and so I think that they my oldest daughter said she started reading one of the books and couldn't because it just sounds too much like me talking <laughs> my, and therefore she can't separate. Amazing. Yeah. You can't separate from it. And also they've heard all my jokes. So it's like the, any, any particularly zingy lines I get in there, they're like, I've heard yes. that before. So, mm-hmm. um, no, they're, they're deeply, deeply disinterested in everything. <laughs> Pretty much everything I do. <laughs> I finally ordered my son to read one of my books. He's reading okay. life and other inconveniences, which came out last year. And I said, look. And which I is... did read, did blurb, did love. Thank so you. I was ready for <laughs> last year's podcast. Oh it's, uh, <laughs> thank you. I appreciate your support. Yeah. Um, you. But I ordered great. him to read it because I said, look, you've never read any of my books and they have put you through college and, you know, right. given you a lot. So it's time to pony up. And um, he's like in his seventh month of still reading the book. Oh my <laughs> so God. Like, you ungrateful little, you know. <laughs> exactly. You little pisser. Um, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Well, my mother was a writer and, um, but I did read her books, uh, but not, I haven't actually still read many of the later ones that, that were published after I left the house. But, mm-hmm. um, but it was weird. And then there was a, a sex scene in her first book that we've never really discussed. And yeah. I'm about to be 50, you know, so it's no. like, it's um, best that way. yeah, it's best. So <laughs> it, it, definitely the experience of reading my mother's books have, has influenced my lack of sex scenes in my books oh, because yeah. I'm, one, I don't want to write about sex because lots of people do it better than me, not the sex, but the writing about it and maybe the sex too, <laughs> who knows? But anyway, the point is it's not a competition people, but, um, it, it, I don't want the thought of them reading that is just too mm-hmm. horrific to me. Like it's just yeah. too mortifying. I also so. write very clean books, and yeah. um, my grandmother was alive when I when my first few books came out, and I thought constantly as I was writing, Graham is going to read this, right. and she's going to know that I know something about sex, even though I had two children at the time. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and I just, I had the same thought, you know, and also I was writing my first couple of books in the kids' playroom, you know, under the watchful gaze oh. of Bob the Builder and Bert and Ernie, oh. you know, so it just I bet Bob happen. was really encouraging though, right? <laughs> I bet Bob was like, can we do it? Yes, yes we, we can. can. <laughs> yeah. Well, it was, it. it was great talking to you. I wish you all the best with your new book. Thank you. And, Thank you. Uh, I wish you all the best, too, for, with your new book that I'm now going to go and get <laughs> and read in the way that I was supposed to so that my publicist, who wrote to me and said, do you need a PDF? And I wrote back and said, no, no, no I read it. I read it last year. Book. It's great. <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm not. Yeah, she's going to kill me. I'm so no sorry. worries. No worries. Have but, a great day. Happy, I will you um, too. Happy pajama and pandemic chic. Yes, back know. to back to work for me. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Me too. I'm going to go take off the sweater and put my pajamas back on the lipstick should stay there because it looks fabulous i thank you thank you it, oh, i girl. you know i believe that expiration dates are for the week so we'll i see agree what happens yeah i agree okay have a we'll great day st- yeah stay well today's episode was brought to you by our friends at dell radio if you love books with a dash of science fiction fantasy or horror be sure to check out dell radio That's D-E-L-R-E-Y-D-I-O. 
It's a podcast run by Del Rey, the world's foremost publishers of speculative fiction. Tune in every Thursday for exclusive interviews between your favorite science fiction and fantasy authors and their editors. And hear all about the nerdy books, games, and media that is bringing the Del Rey staff joy. You can find Del Radio wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts. Thank you for listening to Books Connect Us. For more great book recommendations and information about your favorite authors, feel free to follow Penguin Random House on social media or visit penguinrandomhouse.com. And if you've enjoyed what you've heard, go ahead and leave us a review on Apple Podcasts as it helps more listeners to find our show. This podcast is produced by Pat Stango and edited by Clayton Gumbert. I've been Aaron Leaf, and until next time, this has been Books Connect Us.